Good morning. I'd like to call the February 4th, 2014 Board of Supervisors meeting to order. Roll call, please. Supervisor Carroll? Here. Supervisor Elias? Presente. Supervisor Miller? Here. Supervisor Valadez? Present. Chair Bronson? Here. Let the record show all members are present. Um, before we rise for the invocation, um, and as we rise for the invocation, I want to um, say that it is with sadness that Pima County is recognizing the passing of our own facilities manager, Mr. John Hill. John had left behind a wife, two sons, and a daughter. Our thoughts and prayers are going out to the family. As a licensed architect, John joined the Pima County family in 2007 as project manager and facilities management and was instrumental in the oversight of several critical projects, including the Roy Place facade renovation, the Pima Emergency Communication and Operations Center, um, WR, uh, our wastewater's water analysis lab laboratory, and most recently the new Keno Stadium soccer complex. His passing will be a tremendous loss for our facilities management team and for Pima County in general. John could always be counted on to deliver projects on time and within budget. His outstanding customer service extended not only to his fellow county employees, but also to the numerous vendors and contractors and consultants that he worked with on a daily basis. Despite John's considerable project management skills, his caring nature, team attitude, and dry sense of humor are, will be missed the mo most. And when we rise for the invocation, if afterwards we could have a moment of silence. And the invocation today is going to be offered by Pastor David Hook of Christ Lutheran Vale Church. And it will be followed by the moment of silence and then the pledges, uh, Pledge of Allegiance led by Supervisor Miller. Please rise. Oh, Su Supervisor Bronson, before we, we all stand, I'd like to also mention that uh, another member of Pima County's family was lost this week in John Carlson, oh. who had been a member of the Wastewater Advisory Committee for many years, and a, and a man who uh, was principled. Uh, we all didn't necessarily agree all the time, but John was a good man with a good heart and a nice family. and, and his dedication to Pima County and wastewater facilities uh, should be recognized and noted, and we should think of him as well during that moment of silence. Thank you, Supervisor. Thank you, Supervisor Elias. Please rise. <coughs> o Almighty and merciful God who created, redeemed, and sustains us, we give you thanks for the blessings of this new day. We thank you that even though we come together with varied agendas and needs that often bring conflict among us, we can pause and give thanks to the one who gives order to life and gives life abundantly. O Lord, you ordain leadership to bring order to this chaotic world. We beseech you this day to look with favor upon your servants who serve on the Board of Supervisors. Grant them wisdom that they might lead with integrity. Grant them strength to endure the demands of the position. And grant them peace to know that nothing can separate them from your love. O oh God, any position of leadership is often accompanied with many long and stressful days. No one feels the impact of this more than the family. So today we especially pray for the families of these leaders. May you wrap your loving arms around them and engulf them with your overflowing love, peace, and strength. O oh Lord, we thank you that we live in a country where our leadership is elected from the people. Yet many times our leaders must negotiate agreements that don't always perfectly align with those who elected them. So this day, we pray for the citizens of Pima County. Give them peace to accept the proceedings that bring order to life, strength to continue the fight for those things that must change, and wisdom to know the difference. Lord, we give thanks for the freedom that has been preserved in this nation. We give you thanks for all the brave women and men who serve throughout our country and our world and who sacrifice so much to preserve and maintain this freedom. Thank you for the wide variety of skills and talents you give to each member of our Sheriff Department and all who risk their lives to serve us. Give them courage and integrity as they seek to use their unique gifts in service to others. Protect them from harm and danger even as they protect us. Lord, we pray for the families of those that uh, the Pima County family who have been, uh, who passed away this week. Lord, we pray that you would be with their families and give them your strength and your peace. Lord, may you continue to bless our country, our state, and this nation, that we might use this gift of freedom for the good of all. 
These prayers we ask in your most holy and precious name, O Creator, Redeemer, and Comforter. Amen. Chair, Madam Chair. Supervisor Carroll. Madam Chair, thank, thank you, Pastor Reverend Hook, Pastor Hook. Uh, certainly he knows the cost of leadership since Pastor Hook is now the chairman of the Vail Community Action Board, and congratulations on that role, David. Thank you. I've been to David's house of worship and uh, know David's family, obviously his extended family, his congregation. And I'm just delighted that you had the opportunity to be here today. But I also appreciate that Lutheran spin on the St. Francis theme of <laughs> let's accept the things we cannot change, and the courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. I'm glad that uh, we're so close in our faiths, but we're so close as uh, leaders in our Vail community. And thank you, David, again for being here. And I couldn't think of anybody to better eulogize John Hill and John Carlson than you, sir, and thank you for being here today. God bless, buddy. Appreciate it. All right, our next item uh, um, of business is squeakers. Uh, we are, uh, our animal care officers, Klein and Harrington, are going to tell us a little bit about squeakers. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for having us. This little kid is squeakers. He was brought in, actually an officer picked him up back in December, December 22nd, as an abandonment. We have him down as being a lab chow mix. I don't see either. <laughs> he does have a little polka dotted tongue, some black on the tongue, so that of course is, is characteristic of a chow, but we were discussing it earlier and with this beautiful red coat and the nose and the energy, we're leaning a little towards German Shepherd with the nose, maybe a little hound. I heard somebody else say maybe a little Sharpay because of that forehead. Don't know, but what I do know is he's absolutely a sweetheart. He's um, extremely curious, very friendly, very active. He, I did see him jump up on a chair and then onto a desk. So he um, does need someone who's gonna be able to be active with him and appreciate his curiosity. <laughs> He's, again, I don't know if I mentioned, we're, we're guessing he's maybe three, four years old. And he's just a real sweetheart. He does really well on the leash, did great walking. He would probably do best in a pretty active home. He does have a whole lot of energy. But he's real sweet, real affectionate. He'd be a great companion for anybody. His adoption is actually, his, his fees are free right now because he's been there for such a long time. It's part of one of our promotional ideas. So his only cost would be $15 to get him currently licensed, and that would include his neutering, licensing, microchip, vaccinations, everything he would need to get out of there and, and be someone's forever friend. I would also like to mention, if I could, real quickly, the um, last dog that we brought in, Kush. I don't know if any of you were here remember her, the real big girl that was brought in to oh. get adopted. Hey. So very quickly as well. So let's hope the same for squeakers. Thank you. Thank you, officer. A perfect student dog, wouldn't you say, Chairman Bronson? Absolutely. <laughs> you know, that's what I was thinking, you know. Free, the price is right. Well, you never know. Anyways, please talk to your friends and neighbors about adopting uh, Squeaker, you know, it's a great dog. and, and um, Please be generous in how we treat your animals and uh, how we treat our friends at Animal Care. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now we have some changes to the agenda. Um, on, on the consent calendar, page six, item seven, Habitat for Humanity, Tucson, 
and page six, item eight, our family services. Staff is requesting that we continue these items to the Board of Supervisors meeting of February 11th, 2014. If there are no objections, we'll so amend the agenda. And then in terms of the executive sessions, we have a number of them, both uh, on the regular agenda and the addendum. And they are going to be rather long. Um, so I, I'm going to, at this point, move those executive session items to uh, the last items on our agenda today. And um, with that, we have, I'm going to do, oops, am I missing anything else? Um, I think uh, I want to hear two items out of order. Um, and one is on the, I think the addendum agenda, the appointment uh, for the item 12 of the regular agenda. I'm going to move that one up. And then item 13 will come immediately after that. So at this point, we will hear item 12, Legislative District 2, appointment to fill the vacancy in the House of Representatives for Legislative District 2. We received over the weekend from the chairman of the Arizona Democratic Party um, a letter fulfilling the statutory requirements. Um, there, there was a meeting. The quorum of elected precinct committee persons nominated the following individuals. Demian Klinko, 230 East 23rd Street, St. Uh, Tucson, Arizona, 85713. Miguel Cuevas, 726 East 28th Street, Tucson, Arizona, 85713. And Annabelle Nunez, 2446 South St. Thomas Aquinas Drive, Tucson, Arizona, 85713. Um, so at this point, I will uh, ask the board to um, uh, appoint the new representative from the three names submitted in accordance with Arizona law. Madam Chair. Supervisor Valadez. Madam Chair, it was um, a pleasure being at the uh, at the precinct committee meeting on Saturday, uh, and I got to see actually four really good candidates, uh, three of which were nominated and brought before this board today. Uh, and so it was a real pleasure to see that we have such qualified candidates uh, wanting to, to, to go into public service. With that, uh, I would, uh, uh, I, there was one person who was the top vote getter uh, both times that group has met. Uh, and because of that and because uh, he is well qualified, I nominate Damian Klinko to be the appointee for the LD2 uh, House seat. Second. There's motion and a second. Roll call, please. Supervisor Carroll. Aye. Supervisor Elias. No. Supervisor Miller. Aye. Supervisor Valadez. Aye. Chair Bronson. No. By your vote of three to two, uh, Damian Klinko is our new state representative. Congratulations, Damian. I think uh, all were very qualified. I had hoped to see a woman in that seat to replace a woman, but certainly uh, uh, all the names that came forward were worthy. And again, congratulations. Super, uh, Chair, Chair Bronson, I, I just wanted to comment that I agree with that. I think Damien's a fine man and, and well qualified to do this, but I think it would have been more appropriate to, to have nominated a woman. Thank you. Madam Chair. Supervisor Valadez. Uh, first, let me uh, congratulate Damien on, on his appointment. Uh, secondly, followed having been a former member of both chambers up there, my condolences. <laughs> Uh, Damien, I know that you will do a, a, a good job, and we look forward to working with you. Madam Chair. Supervisor Carroll. Madam Chair, although I had not had the chance to meet with Miguel Cuevas, I did return a couple phone calls and had no luck there, uh, nor have I been able to meet with Annabel Nunez. I admire both their applications and their abilities and certainly their willingness to serve. I see that Don Jorgensen is here today and uh, obviously appreciate uh, your attendance here today as the chairman of your party. And lastly, I want to say, although it was a divided vote, uh, I do uh, first off show that uh, we really had uh, no action uh, until I personally uh, waited for the chair uh, former chairman, but Supervisor Valadez, who represents that area, to make a motion. I want to support Supervisor Valadez because, as he has mentioned twice during these appointments, his experience at the House and the Senate of Arizona mean a lot to me. 
as well as his leadership in the District 2, which encompasses uh, most of in his district, but encompasses our borderlands in Sarita that we share. So thank you that, uh, Damon, you will be representing Green Valley now, so you should expect to hear my list of, of uh, issues that I'd like you to carry up there. Now that I've given you a second, I hope you can give me a, a, a moment of your time to uh, discuss our issues in Green Valley not just uh, senior issues and not just transportation issues, but there's many others that I think will have a mutual uh, need for all of us. So thank you very much. I look forward to serving with you. And if I can help you in any way, I hope you'll give us a call. Thank you, Damian. And, and I know there is a way you can help us, Damian. Um, there's a library bill up there we don't like. Absolutely. <laughs> We're hoping uh, we can uh, get you to uh, help Vote. us uh, defeat that bill. Um, on another note, as you know, Legislative District 2 it also has a component in um, Santa Cruz County. Uh, I have been in contact with several of the supervisors there, and they would very much like to make contact with you when you have a moment. All right. Well, congratulations, and we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, uh, taken out of order. That's item 13, Pima County Fair Commission. Madam Chair. Supervisor Miller. Um, the purpose of this item being put on the agenda is because we have established as of the last meeting that we have two separate commissions, one being the Southwest Fair Commission and the other being the Pima County Fair Commission. The issue at hand is the rules posted on the Clerk of the Board's website governing the appointments to which the Pima County Fair Commission were, excuse me, the appointments to the Pima County Fair Commission. The rules up there were for the Southwest Fair Commission, which conflicted with one another. The Southwest Fair Commission rules state a member can be removed at will, and the Pima County Fair Commission rules states a member can only be removed for cause. Upon further questioning in the last meeting, Mr. Huckleberry did state these board members are from the same, are from both for the same commission, excuse me, they're appointed for both commissions, one being the Southwest Fair Commission, which is a nonprofit, and the other being the fair, Pima County Fair Commission. We have received a memo from Mr. Huckleberry dated January 21st, and I trust you have all seen this background memo. This memo states that the appointments to the Pima County Fair Commission are governed by Resolution 1974-124, and par one paragraph of this resolution reads as follows. There shall be a Pima County Fair Commission consisting of five members appointed by a majority of the members of the Board of Supervisors. Further, on page two, Mr. Huckleberry's memo states, appointments to fill a vacancy, vacancy resulting from other than expiration of term shall be for the unexpired term. A commissioner ba may be removed by a majority of the board members for cause. I move that these rules for appointing members be adhered to as stated by Mr. Huckleberry, utilizing the governing document 1974-124, allowing the past convention of each board member having individual district nominations with the approval of the board majority. Is there a second? In other words, retaining the rules in that's, place as Mr. Huckleberry stated. Do we need to, I'm not sure we, I don't think we need to make a motion on that. The rules are in place. So you're just affirming it, is that correct? I'm affirming and also would like to clarify that the Pima County Fair Commission rules 1974-124 are the ones that apply because what we found on the background material on the board, clerk of the board's website was the Southwest Fair Commission which you said you could remove someone at will right. which is where all the confusion started to begin with. So yes, I, I, I guess I just want to uh, affirm that move that we, we follow this direction because Mr. Huckleberry did give another option where it could be the board majority voting together, not an appointment by district. Okay, so that, let me see if I understand you. Your concern at this point is you, you concur that you can only remove for cause if the term is not ex expired. Is that, is that the case? I'll second. Absolutely, that, will, that is okay. what I'm doing. Okay, so um, Madam, Chair. Madam Chair, I think we have several speakers yes, too that I, um, okay. Mr. Baker is here and Mr. Patrick who, uh, uh, Mr. Patrick I think was instrumental in, in pulling together the two commissions and I, I think before we vote um, we probably should hear from them but Supervisor Elias. Uh, 
you know i i'm not sure i understand the purpose of this motion and what we're doing all we're doing is basically saying what's in place is in place and so there's no need to take any board action i w i would ask council to to help us on this and help us understand what we're doing there's no purpose for us to make a motion if what's in place is simply okay. in place again. Okay. Su supervisor Seems apologize. redundant at best. Okay. For, for clarification purposes, let me see if I can simplify. There were two, two uh, differing rules and we are going with the uh, rules suggested by Mr. Hulkeberg. Correct? Yes, that was the problem is, is but it's, no, there there's, was, two. there's two separate sets of rules. <coughs> Excuse me while I have a frog in my throat. Um, there was one set of rules for the Southwest Fair Commission that said you could remove at will. The conf conflict was with the Pima County rules which said you could only remove for, for cause. cause. And what I was looking for was clarification, what are the rules, mm -hmm. can I remove at will mm -hmm. or is it for cause? It has been clarified now by Mr. Huckleberry that the ruling document is this Pima County rule 1974-124 and that is the rule according to Mr. Huckleberry that will govern future appointments to the Fair Commission. So it clarifies once and for all that that is the document that governs it and um, there will be no more confusion because there were two conflicting sets of rules. I wasn't okay. Well, maybe Madam you weren't, but I was. Madam Chair. Okay, well, let me, okay, let me, let me have Chris weigh in and then we'll sure. get to Supervisor. Madam Chair, Chair, I will yield to Chris Straw, but I would also appreciate that if we could hear from all of our speakers and see if we can make sense. Certainly, it's important that we look, uh, now that the issue's been brought up, and certainly in this hearing, we begin to unfold uh, some of the mystery of not only the, the rules and regs of the Fair Commission, but also the future and how we're going to proceed in that. Uh, because some of the ideas that have been brought up strike a responsive chord with this office. The district does um, hold the fairgrounds, District 4 that I represent. Mr. Baker has been a fabulous addition to the fairgrounds as the executive director. So I'm certainly interested in hearing all the perspectives and I do want to say that it's been illuminating to uh, get all the background information and have conversations with the fairground commissioners that hold the seats today and I am glad that um, we can have it and I hope that we can resolve it today at this hearing. Thank you. Uh, I must admit so Chair Bronson, if I could, I must admit that looking through that document was interesting and, and uh, seeing the dialogue. The historical uh, perspective. Right from a historical <laughs> perspective of uh, Supervisor Castillo who represented District 5 at the time and, and of course Supervisor Murphy who just retired from uh, Pima Council on aging. aging. I almost was going to call Jim and tease him about it a little bit but I, I, I hesitated to do that knowing that it's a, a serious issue for some. Well um, knowing Mr. M Madam Chair and Mr. Elias, <laughs> knowing uh, the history all the way back to Harold Thurber, is, uh, it's important that we make this a streamlined board that uh, has the best interest of not just the Southern Arizona Livestock Association from where it originated, but from all those perspectives that are using the fairgrounds today, which is everyone from the fair to uh, automotive to livestock and all the others in between. So thank uh, you I very much. I can't disagree with that supervisor and, and if anything I would say <coughs> that uh, both those commissions, the Fair Commission and the Southwest Fair Commission have, have done a good job for us and I'm proud of the work that they've done and I'd like to keep them in place. Thank you very much. Mr. Stroth. Yes, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, Mr. Huckleberry's uh, memo uh, states what we believe has been tr true as a matter of law, that the original governing document is uh, Resolution 1974-124. <coughs> to the extent that someone could disagree or there is a conflict, indeed there is a conflict with the bylaws, this gov with, as a matter of law we believe this, that the original resolution prevails. To, to ensure that there is no confusion or to uh, reaffirm the intent of the, of the uh, board with respect to that, that that is indeed the intent of the board. Uh, I, I see the no harm in the order. motion. The motion could be in okay, order. Okay, so the mo sense. motion is in order. All right, well I still, I, I very much do want to hear from Mr. Baker and Mr. Patrick. Um, perhaps I think what struck me as we are reviewing the documents is the original intent of establishing the commission. I know that um, we, um, 
at this point we are drawing some money down from the state um, and I am a little uh, perplexed or I need some enlightenment as to how the membership of the Commission um, reflects our ability to draw down those funds and if you could address that but uh, maybe Mr. Patrick first if I could get you to give us some historical perspective you still have your mustache <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chairman, board members, my name is Bob Patrick. I was a uh, management assistant in the county manager's office in the early 70s. And at that time, as uh, correctly mentioned, the uh, uh, Southern Arizona Livestock Association was running a fair on contract with the county. There were some problems between 4-H, FF, FFA, uh, SALA, on whether the interests of all the users at the time were being properly met and there were some political ramifications that the board at the time was suffering. And so they asked the manager's office to take a look at alternate methods of managing the fair. We put together a committee that was Tom Monahan, who was the deputy director of the Parks Department, Gene Laos, Parks Director, uh, Deputy Finance Director, Supervisor Murphy, Supervisor Castillo, who I always felt kind of brought Pima County out of the dark ages in, in management, and uh, myself. We talked to a number of fairs throughout the West to determine what management structure seemed to work best. Uh, the structure that we adopted was really pr pretty much the way that the Montana State Fair was run um, in Billings, Montana. We all went up to Billings and met with the Fair Commission, their manager, and a bunch of the vendors that were, were dealing with them. And, and we found that the, a small commission that was appointed from folks who had a broad base of backgrounds that were the professional needs of the fair, like accounting, agricultural uses, management, um, promotions, event promotion background were the kind of things that you needed. Just about everywhere we went, we were cautioned to not set up a structure whereby individual supervisors or council members or whatever would appoint term members because you tend to get the politics of whatever that body is embodied in your fair commission, which tends to be counterproductive to the ends of, of producing a fair. As a result, we recommended to the board in that memo that you have that was entitled the Billings Committee that we have a very small commission, five members of folks that were very dedicated to the fair. And that first fair commission were uh, a broad base of, of disciplines that were folks that worked very, very hard at the outset and, and put on a very good fare. Um, that's essentially, in a nutshell, what the history was. The reason that there's the Fair Commission that's, that you appointed, Pima County Fair Commission, the Southwestern Fair Commission, is a nonprofit, was the nonprofit becomes a mechanism for conducting business in a way that is very responsive to the needs of the fair that you'd have a lot more trouble having to do through the county process of contracting with all of the different folks that, that operate the fair. So in a nutshell, that's so, kind so of you, how we go So the are. procurement, I mean, a, as you're arranging for vendors for the fair, or if we went through the county, we would have a number of, uh, we'd probably have to go out with an RFP. Exactly. Uh, so, and for fairs, that probably is rather cumbersome. Mm -hmm. And the, by having the nonprofit corporation, it can respond very quickly to all of the, the requests and things that come in. Otherwise, you, actually what would end up happening was on a great many issues, the board of supervisors would be sitting and acting as the fair commission to make those decisions. So it, it for the purpose of delegating that responsibility to a board to oversee what's what's happening, the nonprofit is the the facilitating vehicle for doing that. Okay. 
Are there any questions for Mr. Chair. Patrick? Uh, Supervisor Carroll. Madam Chair. Mr. Patrick, thank you for being here. Um, I want to ask you just a very pointed question. What's in your review, what's best to leave political interference out of the fairgrounds? <laughs> what option is best, in your opinion, to leave the political interference uh, at the doorstep of, of the county fairgrounds? That's the last thing we need, in my opinion. Uh, I have not seen much of it during my career at the county. But I do want to say in future, uh, what's your opinion on that? You've been very outright, out front. Uh, well, probably ensuring a vehicle for appointment where you have a very broad range of uh, professional backgrounds of the nature that the fair can use in its in its day-to-day -day operations. Particularly, I think, accounting or finance uh, very definitely an agricultural background. Somebody also, another individual or somebody the same, same as the other uh, backgrounds that has a tremendous management experience. And then somebody perhaps that has experience in construction because you have a lot of construction activity mm -hmm. at the fair. Somebody that would have experience in uh, uh, promotion, event promotions. But if you, you can write those into the job descriptions for the appointment, uh, the process, I think, probably the process that uh, uh, Mr. Baker had suggested in his letter to you is one that would provide you the political vetting necessary, as well as ensuring that the Fair Commission itself has an understanding of who in the community has the dedication, the abilities, the talents that they need. Mm -hmm. And so if they were recommending the appointments to the board as a whole, and then as a whole board you were vetting the, the political requirements that you need, probably would be a, a, a very good way of, of appointment. I just regret well. we, didn't, we didn't put a specific <laughs> method in, in the resolution. I wrote the resolution 1974. Right. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to bring it up. <laughs> it's my fault. 45 years. <laughs> Madam it's Chair. It's been a long Supervisor road since Miller. then. Let me complete, if I may. Um, I guess I hit the nail on the head when I appointed Rocco Benet, who just came <laughs> off of his chairmanship of the Accenture match play, as well as a lawyer from Gonzaga. Did you know he has that in his background? And he's a manager of a large construction mm -hmm. entity. So uh, I just want to make sure if, if um, and he's pleased to stay and he'll f fulfill his commitment to his term. But uh, I do have some interest in, in asking uh, that question because I want to make sure that what you're saying is if the board itself recommends members, they would be a recommending body, but it would have to be ratified by the supervisor's office. Is that what yes. I'm surmising from? Yes. I think what that does is it give, it, you retain the, the political control and, and the final word as to whether mm -hmm. somebody's going to be on the commission or not. And the commission itself, if they're recommending to you, they have the ability to know in the community who's available, who would mm -hmm. have the, the time and, and give the devotion to, to the job at hand. I've really not made it a, a, a necessity to appoint a person who lives in District 4, but it's important for all of us to understand if, if this is the road that is going to be chosen to take, uh, that we try to put together a list of people that have certain pedigrees, and mm -hmm. then certainly after <laughs> you've vetted them and made the, 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 uh, the recommendation, then this body would then take that directive and, and decide on its own. That's, there's probably a number of political considerations that in individual board members would have that the commission sh would of necessity have to be sensitive to in mm -hmm. making their recommendations to you. Uh, all this I make a point of because of the fact that it's a six-year appointment, am I right? Uh, it, now it's four years. Some are recommending for a six-year for future if there was going to be. 
Um, I thought I heard that in a conversation with a with a commissioner. It, it may be, but I, I haven't. I'm you never considered longer terms. It was originally two years, and I think there was a resolution in 1986 that changed it to four years. Okay. And that resolution also fortified the language to a certain extent by adding the words at large to the 74 resolution. Thanks so much, Mr. Patrick. I appreciate your answers. Chair recognizes the supervisor from District 1, Supervisor Miller. Uh, Mr. Patrick, first of all, thank you for coming today and thank you for the historical perspective. Um, as you might understand, this resolution was adopted in 1974. There were two conflicting ways that appointments could be done. That was 40 years ago. I mm -hmm. just came on the board. <laughs> I read the rules that were, were behind the appointments mm -hmm. for the Co Fair Commission, which, sa which said at will. We have now clarified that. So it is removal only for cause. Mm -hmm. And um, I, as I said before, I move that the rules that Mr. Huckleberry outlined from the 1974 resolution, it's 1974-124, that we adopt those and continue with the past convention of each board member having individual district nominations with approval by the board majority as we have in the past. Um, there, it was just a matter of confusion. It was nothing to do with um, any historical perspective on the board or um, any member in particular. It was a matter of confusion on how the appointments were done. And I really appreciate all the background and information that you provided, and thank you for being here today. No, you're more than welcome. Thank you, Supervisor Miller. Are there any other questions of Mr. Patrick? No, I'd like to hear from Mr. Baker if he has. Particularly, Mr. Baker, as you're, you're approaching um, the podium, um, you're, you've made some recommendations in a memo dated uh, to, to Chuck Huckleberry in a memo dated January 24th regarding um, uh, the operation of the commission. Um, and I would like you to kind of elucidate um, your reasoning and what. Um, and, by the way, how uh, how long have you been the professional manager uh, at the Fairgrounds? Okay. Madam Chair, members of the board, thank you so much for the opportunity to address you. I um, actually began my career in fair management in 1987 in my hometown of Flagstaff uh, with Coconino County. I became the Parks and Recreation Director for Coconino County in 1987. And with that, we had the responsibility of producing the Coconino County Fair, the Coconino County Horse Races, and the, uh, we worked with the Pro Rodeo Association. And so along that path, uh, I kind of came slowly south until I got to the right place, which was after 10 years as the manager in Flagstaff, I became the assistant manager with the Arizona State Fair up in Phoenix. And then I've been here, it looks like going on my 13th fair with the uh, Pima County Fair. So along that, uh, that path, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of fair associations in the uh, Southwest and nationwide, and uh, served as the president of the Western Fairs Association, um, gosh, four years ago now. And with that, you get involved with a number of different fair operations and how affairs are structured, how boards are set up. And even within the state of Arizona, there are three different types of associations and many different board uh, structures, even within our small um, system of fairs in Arizona. And you get a chance to speak with the different fair managers and fair boards to try to understand what works um, and, and what seems to be the most effective and most beneficial to the fair and to the community. And my recommendation was really following along that path. Um, I'm very fortunate that uh, Mr. Patrick was available and I got a chance to go back and research some of the information that all of you have seen now, but to pick his brain a little bit and try to understand their, um, their intent when, when everything was set up here with the Southwestern Fair Commission um, I really believe that because of the research that was done and the commitment by Pima County to send the group 
up to Montana to take a look at um, what seemed to be the best structure at the time is amazing to me because it's, to me, it's still the best structure. And it's the most effective and it's the most beneficial to the county, uh, primarily because of the, uh, the background and the expertise that the various members, the five members have that bring to the table. Even though I've been in fair management for uh, over 25 years, there is still a level of need in the community um, on a board uh, specific to that community and the networking within that community with folks that understand um, the local um, um, operations, politics, and so on. And so even with our board, that to me seems to be the best structure and it has been so beneficial to me as a fair manager and being effective with our staff at the fairgrounds. You've done an excellent job during your tenure. Um, I can remember when I first uh, came on the board, there were um, some serious deficiencies with the commission and the operations of the fair. And one of the things that concerned me at that time was that the board members were interfering in the daily operations of the, of the uh, management. And um, there really, we didn't have that level of professional management that we needed. I think we do now, and uh, my concern as we move forward is that we keep that structure in place and that the board be a recommending board and um, it's the director that executes the, the, then the daily operations and the, uh, um, the will of, of the commission, but that uh, we don't have the micromanaging that certainly was um, there at the time that I was first elected. So again, I want to thank you for your service. Um, you are recommending, and I think it, it makes sense to me at least, that the commission uh, be comprised of individuals that bring expertise uh, of, of varying sorts to, to the fair. And um, I think that where I, I sense um, my colleagues and I have a decision to make is I think we probably all agree we need that professional expertise, but how do we accomplish that? Do we still uh, nominate or do we still um, do it by district? I don't know. Maybe Mr. Huckleberry, um, who's been, who's the institutional memory, remembers when, um, because at the point in time I came on the board, we were um, picking by district. When did the process of picking at large to become by district? Do you know, Mr. Huckleberry? Uh, <clears throat> Ms. Madam Chair and members of the board, there's really two additional resolutions I think has been referenced, one in 1986, and I think, um, and let me just kind of give you the second paragraph of that resolution, it simply states, um, and it's amending 74-124, which is the one that talked about the uh, for cause removal. And then when paragraph two says, there shall be a Pima County Fair Commission consisting of five at-large commissioners appointed by a majority of the Board of Supervisors. In addition, Mr. Gene Reed shall serve on the commission as a commissioner emeritus. Now, Mr. Reed has passed away. And so that was in 1986 is when they kind of reaffirmed the issue of at-large appointments. Uh, and then uh, what happened with, there was another resolution, 1991-90, that set up the staggered terms um, of board members and probably the extension of the term. And the, the, that paragraph three uh, is where the first time, and that's why I say in my letter I talk about this historical drift to supervisor appointment. And it's got a column on it. It says supervisor represented. And it lists the members and assigned to each member as a supervisor. So somewhere between 86 and 91 is when this historical drift occurred. Uh, and um, that, that uh, you know, resolution is uh, the, the, the several that we have. So what it did is stagger the terms and really put in the four-year term at, in 91. So there's where the confusion lies. And I think as, as obviously as the board knows is probably since that time you've been making uh, either, you know, representation appointments by a supervisor. I don't think it's been district confined. Uh, and it's just over time uh, either we've been fortunate or just lucky that we've had uh, the balanced representation that's continued on the commission. 
So the board's choice, I think, is is to really talk about at-large appointments and if you want to direct us to ask for criteria uh, with regard to that and, and obviously come back at a future d date so everybody's very, very clear about what occurs with regard to making at-large appointments based on specialty of expertise, I think is what I hear from um, the, the individuals making the presentations today. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any further questions of Mr. Baker by any board member? Thank you, Mr. Baker. Mr. Thank you very Baker, much. I do have a question. Oh. When's the fair this year? April 17th through the 27th. Well, thank you very much. I'm sure very everybody well. here will want to know that. <laughs> thank, <laughs> you, thank you, Supervisor Carroll. Uh, we have a motion on the floor which affirms um, what we've just been speaking about. Um, I'm going to call the question and unless we have any uh, just on that motion and then I think we um, have, after that need to discuss where we go from here um, are there any any discussion of the board members supervisor Elias you yeah I, I would just comment that you know it, it strikes me odd um, that we're making a motion and that our county attorney has said that this motion is in order that that's fine but really it's redundant and and it makes no sense and, and we we'll wasted our time here this morning and that's unfortunate but uh, I think it's really born of, of of some kind of change that someone wants to make I hope it's certainly not about um, political monkey business so um, I, I just am kind of astounded by this and and uh, probably vote against the motion because it's already what exists and it's not a vote against what ex exists but uh, rather just kind of uh, not understanding exactly what uh, is the case here in front of us. Thank you, Supervisor. Um, Counselor, you had some comments? Y yes, I, I think I'm a bit confused, and it's important not that I'm confused. <laughs> Whether That's I'm confused or not is irrelevant. Fine. The point <laughs> is we've got to make certain we know what the motion is. And my answer to the questions uh, we're dealing with is paragraph number four, that issue of four cause. I did not consider in my answer the subsequent, uh, and we have in our, obviously in our materials, the uh, issue dealing with paragraph three, and that is the issue of how. No, you know, the motion only deals with the, uh, as you indicated, it, it doesn't deal with any of the others. If, if we're only dealing with paragraph four and affirming what the intent yeah, is, then there's no confusion. Because okay. otherwise no, you're no. going to be amending these well, other. No, that's, that's the point. That was why okay. where I wanted to go next. We can only deal with paragraph four at this point, but since this memo references several, I then was seeking direction from the board or if they wanted to proceed in any fashion to amend um, the uh, structure as it exists or as it, as it exists historically today. Okay. Very good. Ma Madam Chair. Supervisor Carroll. I believe it's germane to um, ask Mr. Huckleberry on this whole issue. Uh, it seems that I, I have not uh, yet um, found a vehicle to carry us forward. Uh, Mr. Huckleberry, what's your recommendation about, a, uh, rec about the Fair Commission itself vetting, recommending candidates, sending them to us for, for our final approval. Uh, is that going to, in your opinion, um, set back uh, the course or is that going to aid the course? This, this man, Mr. Baker, is, uh, each and every year has exceeded his last year. It's a record-breaking fair each and every year. I know that uh, the Ted Nugent concert was the number one concert we've ever had under Mr. Baker's direction. And I want to say that uh, although I wasn't there, I see one member of our audience probably videotaped it. Maybe I can watch it later. <laughs> but uh, I do want to say that, uh, Mr. Huckleberry, do you have any recommendations? You've been around as long as Mr. Patrick, apparently. And I'd certainly like to hear about uh, how you think we could depoliticize and move forward with uh, expertise that is appropriate. Uh, Madam Chair and uh, members of the board, the, the the uh, process recommended uh, in, I think, uh, from the executive director of the Southwest Fair Commission is fine, uh, but it's really up to the board. And uh, if whatever you decide, um, if you want that process, I would also suggest that 
uh, it would be very clear that they're at large and, and then if you want to, to specify the specialty expertise that's represented by the appointment uh, so that you have some measure to grant or to evaluate the recommendations out of the, the commission uh, or the Southwest Fair Commission for their appointment. So it's really up to the board. Um, Mr. Huckleberry, don't you think that changes over time? And so I hate to see us get locked into specialties because, um, you know, Mr. Baker, look at, look at your tenure here. And things change. And the needs of the fairs change. And so I think it's dangerous to put that in writing instead, but be practical and speak about it and have good, healthy conversations about it. I mean, perhaps I'm spoiled by, by Ms. Patrick, who represents me on on the uh, fair commission, and she's done a good job, you know, and she has uh, a multiple of different skills available to her. So, um, you know, perhaps I, I, you know, I'm spoiled, like I said, but I, I hate to see us committing to something like that in writing because, frankly, the needs of the fair change on a regular basis. We've been doing this fair for more than a hundred years now, and uh, one thing we've recognized is that change is imminent. Uh, when it comes to the fair as it progresses over time. And that's really the intelligent way to do business. Thank you, Supervisor Elias. Um, at this point, the motion is just relating to paragraph four. I'm going to ask for a roll call vote. And then if there is further direction to um, the <coughs> staff uh, regarding uh, the appointment process for the, the fair commission, um, I would entertain a, a motion to so direct staff, but let's do the first Supervisor Valadez. Madam Chair, if, if I may uh, offer a direction to staff to uh, go ahead and clarify the bylaws of the Southwest Fair Commission to match these that we're, uh, that we're uh, codifying today. Okay. It, as an amendment to the mo are you, are you I amending? accept that amendment. Right. Okay. You're, you're ex okay, we're amending the motion, and the seconder is fine with that? I am the seconder. So, oh, so, oh, who was, oh, it was Allie was the first. I'm sorry, Supervisor yes, Miller. I, I accept right. that amendment. Okay, okay. Right, so now we're going to make both processes the same, as opposed to what we have today that's been working that's, for the last 40 years. No, I mean, what we're doing I'm is just this, asking. No, no, I think, go ahead. No. If, if I may clarify, what happens is that at the Southwest Fair Commission bylaws, say that they can be removed without cause. Our bylaws say it has to be with cause. We are saying now both of them are going to be that they can only be removed for cause. Okay, that's fine. I, I, I understand that distinction. And uh, yeah, it's okay. fine with me. Uh, I'll, I'll the, okay, let's, let's, let's uh, move on with the vote. Let's do a roll call. Ms. Madam Chair. No, we, we're moving on with the vote. Supervisor Carroll. Yes. Supervisor Elias. <laughs> Supervisor Miller? Yes. Supervisor Valadez? Aye. Chair Barrington? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Supervisor Carroll? Well, again, Madam Chair, I appreciate all the time that the Southwest Fair Commission has put in on this item. <laughs> I also want them to know that if they do come up with an idea that uh, they'd like to float past, I hope they will contact uh, my office. And I don't uh, believe. Um, they would waste that call if they'd like me to come out and listen to their concerns about whether what was just voted on or if they have a better idea or a different vehicle to carry you into the next fair uh, season, let us know because I trust the fair commissioners and I trust the executive director. Thank you for being here today, John, and good that's luck. A, that's a good one, Ray, and I hope it doesn't take as long to explain it to them uh, as it's taken to uh, consider this point. <laughs> Thank you. No, I think, uh, I think that they're uh, very capable of understanding their own business. Okay, I, I, well, I need some clarification from the board regarding the memo of January 28th from Mr. Huckleberry on the commission appointment process, uh, also reflected in the memo from Mr. Baker of January 24th to Mr. Huckleberry. Does the board at this point wish to change the appointment process as it has historically existed. No. Madam Chair. So there's no further direction to staff. Supervisor Carroll. Madam Chair, I, I think that um, it would be important to get the commission's perspective on that. And I would appreciate hearing back from them if they want to discuss that at their next meeting. I know you have a lot on your agendas, 
I know you get good participation from your group, so please have a closed door session and tell us what you feel. Uh, has this experience brought you enough into the public spotlight that you would like to regress back to uh, <laughs> your own chambers for the in perpetuity? Thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor Carroll. Let's move on to our regular agenda in regular order now. Um, moving on to the Flood Control District Board, item nine, drainage easement and maintenance agreement. What's the pleasure of the board? Madam Chair, I'll go ahead and move the item. <laughs> Madam. Second. Madam Motion Chair. and a second. <coughs> Any objections? Madam Chair, on the Flood Control District Board, number nine, drainage easement, yes. uh, Northwest Hospital. I just want to clarify that in some of our materials, it says District one and District four. But I do, Mr. Zimmerman has clarified that this is just District 1. Although District 4 does border District 1 along that Catalina kind of. Divide, the Great Divide. The Great Divide there from the forest on over to the town. So. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, are there any objections to the motion? Hearing none, motion carries. We now move on to item 10, consent calendar, call to the public. Madam, oh. Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to address us on a consent? calendar item. If not, Supervisor Elias. Madam Chair, I move that item 16 be uh, removed for individual consideration. Is there a s uh, item 16? Second. Second. Okay. okay. We will vote on item 16 separately, Supervisor Elias. Yes, Madam Chair, you know, um, this is another one of our design, build, and operate schemes out there at um, Wastewater and um, Personally, uh, uh, this is a public health issue, and it continues to be, and uh, we are not meeting um, really our responsibility to the public, I think, in uh, taking care of the public health by, by privatizing those, those uh, notions and um, putting uh, profit in the equation for those folks who deal with hazardous materials. Uh, there are a number of poisonous uh, materials that are are going to be a part of this operation with this biogas and ultimately uh, that private provider will be handling that the material and and certainly they can claim that they'll be in compliance with EPA and all federal regulations but I, I just think that that's something there should be a direct line of responsibility between the county and the folks who live in our communities and um, we do not have that and the other thing it shows is that there's a tremendous amount of profit available in uh, using biogas to create electricity. And we had a discussion about that last year, and there's a lot of upfront costs related to building a plant to do that. But clearly this shows that uh, those biogases are profitable, and they're going to remain profitable for many years to come and create good, clean electricity provided the poisons are, are handled correctly in cleaning up that gas. Uh, don't feel confident about this. Don't feel confident uh, with our folks out there. So um, I just wanted to uh, have this item voted on individually. Uh, I'd make a motion to turn it down. Is there a second? Hearing none, motion fails. With the pleasure of the board. We approve the item. Second. Motion and a second to approve item 16. Objections? One. One objection. Hearing no other objection, motion carries. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd go ahead and move uh, the remainder of consent as amended. Second. Motion and a second to approve the remainder of consent as amended. Are there objections? M Hearing? Madam Chair. Supervisor Carroll. Madam Chair, I'd just like to mention under the Rossi contract for lobbying for federal representation. Uh, I've gone ahead and reviewed the contract. If I might, I wanted to make a couple comments about it. Sure. Understand that this contract is going to create an umbrella organization that includes former U.S. Congressman <coughs> Jim Colby, uh, who ably represented Pima County and the district, uh, including Cochise and Santa Cruz for many years. Uh, it also includes Stephen Block, who was a uh, in governmental affairs for Honeywell in Phoenix and who's now had many federal and state contacts that should aid and abet. We're hoping that the overlap with Jim Colby pulls on his strengths of two things, military uh, expertise. He worked with us in the last BRAC round as the congressman 
and uh, I hope that he can do things for us when it comes to the A-10 and the, uh, the, the idea that we should have a continued A-10 squadron at Davis Monthan Air Force Base. I also hope that he'll overlap on the trade issues of I-11 into Mexico. So his experience with Stephen Block as well uh, will mainly be spent in the nation's capital. Uh, I really appreciate Michael Rossi's leadership in the state. I was recently up at the Gilbert Temple of the Latter-day Saints, and uh, of course Mr. Rossi was there, and uh, he has many contacts in the state and federal. We had a long conversation about the renewal of this contract, and I'm completely confident that Mr. Rossi, Mr. Block, and Colby, Congressman Colby, will be able to best represent us when it comes to our needs on not only the border, but in the military uh, arena that we so often face, but especially now it's reached a crisis point. So I'm grateful that we have this contract on the agenda, and I'm looking forward to working with them to, to b get the best uh, and the most bang for our buck from the contract. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Carroll. If there are no other comments, um, what's th we have a motion on the floor to approve. Are there any objections? Hearing none, motion carries. Moving on. Madam Chair. Supervisor Elias. I'll go ahead and move items 14 and 15, including resolutions 2014-9 and 2014-10. Second. Motion and a second to approve 14 and 15 in resolution 2014-9 and 10. Objections? Hearing none, motion carries. Item 16. Second. Are there any objections? Hearing none, motion carries. Moving on to hearings, franchises, license, permits, extension of premises, item 17, and extension of premises, item 18. Madam Chair, I'll move to uh, close public hearings and approve item 17 and 18. Second. Motion and a second. Any objections? Hearing none, motion carries. Moving on to the addendum agenda. Board of Supervisors sitting in regular session, items three and four. Madam Chair. Supervisor Miller. Um, I have um, an objection to item four. <clears throat> We're currently, um, this Mike. is $12,500 for the University Mobile Health Program. This contingency fund it, it, for the Board of Supervisors is to be used for emergencies and unforeseen needs that occur during the year we have given the University of Arizona $30 million in the last fiscal year for graduate medical education. We are currently giving them $15 million this year for graduate medical education. And we give them a, a hospital for a lease of $100 per year. This contingency fund is nearly used up for this year already. We have used more than $810,000. And if we approve this item, we will only have $9,000 left in our emergency contingency fund for the year. It is time the University of Arizona stops living off the backs of Pima County taxpayers. People are getting their tax bills with a 19% increase in valuations in the southeast side and other areas, and people are just beginning to understand the tax increase from last year. We need to stop funding the University of Arizona if we're going to stop this never-ending tax increase. So I move that we deny item number four, mobile health program, for $12,500. Is there a second to that motion? Motion fails for lack of a second. Madam Chair. Part. Oh. Part. Move approval of item number uh, four. Second. Motion and a second to approve item four. Objections? I object. One objection. Motion carries. Move to item three, payment in lieu of taxes in resolution 2014-11. Supervisor Madam Carroll. Chair, I'd like to move Item three, I'd also like to make note that at the County Supervisor Association of Arizona board meeting last week, uh, this resolution passed unanimously. It was carried by Maricopa County, but of course uh, all counties of Arizona were in support. Payment in lieu of taxes is a very important issue, and the, hopefully the Congress as well as our lobbyists that work under the Rossi contract will assist in the state. Uh, getting our full funding for the payment in lieu of taxes program. Second. Motion and a second to approve. And I'd note that uh, Senator McCain has come out in support of 
addition the pelt payments we did we did have a, a representative from senator mccain's office but i also want to say that um, the leadership of craig sullivan and the county supervisor association on this issue has made it unanimous across the state and we're, gra we're, we're grateful for his leadership as well there's motion and a second on the floor any further discussion hearing none motion any objections hearing none motion carries Moving on to item five. Madam um, Chair. Supervisor Elias. I'm going to move item uh, five and uh, make special note of items A, B, and C as direction to staff. Second. Motion and a second to approve item five, proposed Reddington Water Conservation District. Um, are there any objections? Madam, Madam Chair, there's no objection, but I would like to appreciate publicly uh, the Small House family. Andrew and Mary especially who work to create the Reddington Water Conservation District. It's going to be a benefit to their area along the riparian San Pedro, but also it's going to benefit the uh, ranch lands that we cooperate with the small houses, especially the Bayota. So thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor Carroll. Uh, if there's no further discussion, are there any objections? Hearing none, motion carries. Development services, final plat with assurances. Without Madam assurances. Chair, I move to approve item six, final plat without assurances. Is there a second? Second. Uh, are there any objections? Hearing none, motion carries. Moving on to contract and award item seven, Marana Unified School District Amendment number two, and item eight, grant applications acceptance. Uh, what's pleasure of the board on items seven and eight? Madam Chair, I'll, I'll move items 7 and 8. Second. Motion and a second to approve items 7 and 8. Madam Chair. Supervisor Carroll. Doesn't Marana Unified School District Amendment Number 2 provide childhood immunization services? Doesn't that come from the mobile health program that we voted earlier? in the consent calendar regarding I think that's our it's, uh, it's a Lesher. Program. Don't those don't Mi those got, overlap well, let, let's Ms. Um, Lesher here thank you Miss Lesher uh, Madam Chair Supervisor Carroll no those are different it's a different funding I understand thank I do you. note that uh, the mobile health program from this university does go to Marana a couple of days but the child immunization is a separate program uh, Madam Chair, Supervisor dovetailed. Carroll, this is a separate program that deals only with vaccinations and provides funding from the state for the support, actually the purchase of the vaccine, and then we partner with Marana for the training and the immunizations of the students. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any further, excuse me, is there any further discussion? If not, are there any objections? Hearing none, motion carries. We are, I'm going to move to call to the public. We have several, and then after that, I'll do call to the public for exec session. Mary Murphy. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, board. Nice to see you. What's Mary Murphy's excellent adventure gonna to be today? Well, in my spare time, I kind of tooled around the mine tailings, that, and it's a, it was like being in the twilight zone. To be honest with you, I scared myself. I'm like, I'm not going back there alone anymore. I could be found, who knows, if my car broke down or something like that. It scared the hell out of me. I want to thank Supervisor Bronson for this wonderful article about the Rosemont Mine and kind of the overview uh, is a picture of something that I hadn't seen, you know, the, a total picture. Uh, I, I had read it intently before I got to the bottom to see who had, who had written it, so I want to thank you. My first phone call was to the Green Valley News. Why don't, am I not reading this in the Green Valley News? Not fluffy enough for the Green Valley News? This is, we really got to cover stuff like this. Uh, I think there might be a higher and better use for those mine tailings. I hear they need landfill on our Gulf and East Coasts. And, and I don't know how we're going to square it all with the book of Deuteronomy and the Bible that states, out of the mountains of the land you will mine copper. Deuteronomy uh, 
chapter a seven to nine it's in the bible now what are we going to do about that and after all the business with flood control there's a movie coming out with Russell Crowe playing Noah and I cannot wait to see how his government officials and his neighbors treat him and since the latest thing and we're also going to have some Salem witch trials coming on TV now I know what a witch hunt is like and character assassination this is like here we go again my flag displayed in front of my home is in distress mode and it will stay that way until things are straightened out in my neighborhood with my association with Green Valley Council I've stated that before my last arrest charges were dismissed with prejudice Pima County's got some splaining to do we will be doing that 281 plus see to Arcos behind my house goes on the auction block February 28th these are homes that have been in the hands of poor people burdened with things like GVR fees and I can't wait to see what it goes for but it's a couple doors away from Pima County drainage way plus see to Arcos not one of the numbered ones it's supposed to have a number we have a swamp cooking back there and homes in danger and who do I call with regard to mosquito abatement health issues thank you very much thank you you know you can always call Green Valley's office to who's you can call my office in Green I did Valley last summer last monsoon for mosquitoes, season mosquitoes please do. yeah uh, let us know the council office so what am I supposed to do there you're allowed to call our office ma'am for sure Jerry Jerry Adebani <laughs> Madam Chairman and Board of Supervisors my name is Jerry Adebani and I live in Oro Valley Deputy Chief County Administrator Martin Willett was injured on a bicycling accident crossing Fort Lowe Bridge June 30th 2013 Mr. Willett retired from Pima County August 10th 2013 I was rehired three days later on August 13, 2013 to work 19 hours per week and is currently employed as a Deputy Chief County Administrator. I would like to know what his hourly rate is and if this is public record. According to this claim filed against Pima County on December 18, 2013, Mr. Weld has had multiple major surgeries. He have nine listed during a six-month period June to December 2013. The claim states, and I quote, his injuries are described as catastrophic, permanent and disabling. How could he possibly be working during this time when he was had all these surgeries and in rehab and these catastrophic injuries? In the claim, Mr. Willett admits he was looking to the left, preparation for a turn onto a bike path after he crossed the bridge. This appears to be negligence on part for not paying attention to his surroundings and riding in a slow and safe manner in preparation for his turn. Also, the claim states Pima County had been notified of these dangerous conditions on the bridge numerous times by a Pima County employee named Matt Wazol. These reports were filed during Mr. Wilt's employment as a number two man in charge of Pima County. He was a chief deputy county administrator at that time. He is, is he not responsible for the lack of action for the repairs on the bridge? Shocking. He was an agent of the county and he failed to have this bridge repaired in the claim it states that the county should have acted on this. Where is accountability? Why hasn't the transportation director been fired for this lack of action regarding these very dangerous conditions? I presume Mr. Willett carried health insurance either through Pima County or his wife's law firm which filed the complaint against Pima County. So this claim is for pain and suffering. Five million for Mr. Willett and one million for his wife. Shocking while we all sympathize with Mr. Willett he chose to ride his bike that morning on a dangerous bridge and he assumed the risk of all bike riders do when riding in dangerous crumbling cities, uh, streets in Pima County. As Chief Deputy Administrator, he should have been more aware and most of the hazard conditions of the county. Therefore, do we need to cancel all future bike events such as the El Tour de Tucson? Selling the lawsuit with awarding this outrageous claim will set a precedence that will open Pima County and we the taxpayers to the risk of numerous lawsuits in the future. 
Finally, I'd like to give all of you a beautiful picture of Mr. Willett, who attended the January 14, 2014 Governor State of the State Address, where he, where it was held in Tucson. According to those who attended, Mr. Willett walked in unassisted and is shown seated in his chair. Shocking. Also here is an article written by a bike rider in the opinion section of the Star, who also was totally disgusted. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move call to the audience for executive session. <sighs> Pete Saban. <coughs> Madam Chairman, members of the board, um, my name is Pete Saban. I'm the assistant business manager for IBW Local 570. And I'm here before you this morning um, on behalf of Rosemont Mine. I know you're considering uh, whether or not to object to uh, the uh, environmental impact study and moving forward with the mine. Um, I just want to comment that we have over 100 members out of work in our local. Um, these would be good jobs. Um, I know that the construction part of it would only be for a couple of years. But to a construction worker, I'm myself an electrician, I can tell you that a two-year job is an eternity. Um, there would also be 400 high-paying jobs going forward uh, that would be revenue, tax revenue for the, the county and the city. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I'm not really saying anything that most of you haven't heard, uh, but I think it bears repeating that Rosemont has uh, really bent over backwards. This has been going on for seven years now, and they uh, have downscaled the, their proposed operations. And as I said to uh, Congressman Barber's chief of staff, um, when we were opening the, uh, or welcoming the first streetcar here to Tucson, I said, you know, it takes a lot of copper to run those streetcars, doesn't it? Um, copper is a strategic metal. There are only three smelters that produce copper in the United States, two here in Arizona, one in Utah. Um, I don't believe that we want to be in a position where we need to go to China or Peru for our copper. Um, we, there was a cave-in at the Utah mine last year, and uh, they, they were out of operation for a little while. So I think that uh, we need to consider the usage of copper in this country. Um, if you use a cell phone or these lights, um, you know, everything runs on copper. <clears throat> we need copper for our society, and unfortunately, you have to mine copper where it is. And where it is is where it's been for a couple hundred years. It's been mined down in that area. And to me, the people who are prote protesting the mine, it's kind of like moving into the flight path of an airport and saying, hey, I want you to stop flying these planes. They're making a lot of noise. Um, I, think that, uh, I think that we need the jobs. And as far as the water goes, we're already drawing the aquifer below us unsustainably anyway. And we're going to have to do something like build a desalinization plant in Mexico or Southern California and ship water in anyway. So whether it comes from building too many homes and, and it happens in 30 years or 40 years, or, you know, it's going to have to be done anyway. So um, I beseech you to consider the benefits of the Rosemont Mine and to work with the Rosemont people to come up with the best plan possible. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to address us um, for executive session items only? Please fill out a green card. I don't think we have a green card for you. Well, well, you don't need to do it right now, but when you're done. Madam Chairman and members of the board, uh, my name is Mark Sutton. I'm the president of Meridian Engineering Company, which is a Tucson-based heavy civil industrial contractor homegrown, uh, and we've been dealing with the impacts of the recession now for five years. I respect your study and hard work on the Rosemont Mine. I respect the difficult decisions that you have to make. The balance between what all of the shareholders are. But I want you to have the perspective from business the business community within Pima County. It's been very, very difficult. I've lost over 100 employees over the last five years. I don't want to lose another 100. Every one of those employees had a family to support, children to care for. 
And I just want you to consider just how important it is to the business community when you're balancing your judgment on filing a formal action and further delaying the process. I don't envy your positions because you have tough decisions to make, but I sure want you to hear from the business community. I've talked with many business owners, many suppliers in the industry and in our community, and this is, tough, this is still tough, tough times for us. And we, we really need that mine and that economic boost to get us back somewhere close to where, where we were. It's not gonna get us there. It's not gonna make up for the last five years, but it's been tough. Thank you for your time. Thank you. If there are no further speakers, I'd entertain a motion to move into exec. Um, Motion and a second to move into exec. We have two items on the addendum agenda and three items on the regular agenda. We'll convene, reconvene at the sound of the gavel.
we are back in session let the record show all board members are present we had a number of executive session items councillor item six yes madam chair members of the board executive session item six and seven on the regular agenda concern a proposed settlement in target corporation versus pima county arizona tax court case numbers tx 2012-555 and tx 2013-244 in these cases the plaintiff challenges for tax years 2013 and 14 the valuation of real property and improvements known as the target.com retail distribution warehouse located south of reader ranch and east of reader road across from the university of arizona technical park and within the foreign trade zone for tax year 2013 and tax year 2014 the proposed settlement would reduce the fair market value of the for a cash value of the property the legal classification and assessment ratios will remain the same out of the proposed settlement the approximate tax decrease for tax year 2013 is thirty seven thousand nine hundred thirty six dollars and ninety one cents including possible rounding errors and for tax year 2014 is fifty two thousand four hundred twenty dollars also including possible rounding errors the tax refund correction for the two years is approximately ninety thousand three hundred fifty six dollars ninety one cents as part of the settlement both sides agree to bear their own costs and attorney's fees and litigation expenses the pima county assessor and the pima county attorney recommend the proposed settlement What's the pleasure of the board? Madam Chair. Supervisor Elias. I'll uh, move the county attorney and the county assessor's recommendation. Second. This is for items six and seven? That's correct. We have a motion and a second to approve the county attorney and assessor's recommendation for items six and seven. Are there any objections? Hearing none, motion carries. Moving on to item eight, Counselor. Yes. Madam Chair, members of the board, executive session item eight on the regular agenda concerns the county's potential response to the final environmental impact statement and the draft record of decision regarding the proposed uh, Rosemont Copper Mine. The county administrator and the county attorney seek authority to proceed with objections as discussed in executive session. What's the pleasure of the board? Madam Chair. Supervisor Elias. I move that we uh, uh, support the uh, county attorney's recommendation. Second. Motion and a second to um, support to move the county attorney's recommendation. Um, are there any objections? Yes, there is an objection. Are there any further objections? Hearing none, motion carries four to one. Supervisor Miller voting nay. Moving on to the addendum agenda. Yes, um, Madam Chair. Executive session item number one on the addendum agenda relates to the incomplete uh, development. Uh, developer transportation improvements in the Star Valley residential development located near the intersection of Valencia Road and, w- and Wade Road. At this point, the, the presentation was for information only, so no action is needed by the board. Moving on to executive session item two on the addendum agenda. This concerns a Valencia Coal Properties LLC versus Pima County, United States District Court case number uh, four colon 13 CV. 0-1-3-1-9-DCB. This item relates to a property owner's lawsuit against Pima County alleging that the county is legally obligated to reconstruct the intersection of Valencia and Colb Roads on the <coughs> southern alignment. The county attorney's office seeks direction to defend the lawsuit as discussed in executive session. What's the pleasure of the board? Madam Chair. Supervisor Lee. Move the county attorney's recommendation. Second. Motion and a second to approve the county re- County Attorney's recommendation. Are there objections? Hearing none, motion carries. We've already had our call to the audience. There's no further business. So without objection, this meeting stands adjourned. <coughs>